Ontario has been called Canada's heartland province, and with good reason. In addition to its geographic position at the center of the country, it is also Canada's most populous province, and contributes a lion's share of the national GDP. The origin of the Mackinac jacket, the quintessential Canadian accent, the Tim Hortons franchise, and hockey legend Wayne Gretzky, it has produced some of the icons most emblematic of the Great White North. Although neighboring Quebec has the distinction of being the historic birthplace of Canada, Ontario is the crucible in which the budding nation came of age, bathed in the fires of the War of 1812. Ontario's long and storied history is peppered with tales of the unexplained, from the vampire legends of the Ontario Kashubs, through eerie traditions concerning its picturesque waterfalls, to the ghost stories which color its many haunted hotels. We have covered some of these stories in previous videos, and will revisit four such videos in this piece. First, we will return to Cobalt, Ontario, a remote mining town in the Canadian Shield, said to be home to both an unusual wild man and a legendary lake monster. Next, we will revisit Niagara-on-the-Lake, supposed to be Canada's most haunted town. Finally, we will return to an old video on the many nautical mysteries of Ontario's Great Lakes. Enjoy. In recent years, Western Canada has seen the resurgence of a small but impassioned political movement, proposing that the western half of Canada ought to separate from its eastern counterpart. This philosophy stems from the notion that the Western provinces take an unfair backseat to the provinces of Ontario and Quebec in federal politics, and is underpinned by the century-old sentiment that Western and Eastern Canada are essentially distinct and separate nations. Politics and culture aside, anyone who has made the long drive between Western and Eastern Canada can attest to the fact that the historic metropolises of Southern Ontario and the Laurentian Valley and the mixed forests and lush farmland which surround them, are at least geographically separated from the Manitoba prairies that mark the eastern edge of western Canada by a sprawling, sparsely populated tract of wilderness, bridged only by two narrow ribbons of railway and quiet two-lane asphalt. This rugged stretch of Canadian shield is a natural borderland, having served in centuries past as the ill-defined no-man's land separating Rupert's land the territory of the northerly British Hudson's Bay Company, from the Pays d'Ao, or Upper Country, of French Canada. In a manner reminiscent of medieval cartography, in which monsters populate the blank spaces of the map, legend has it that this remote frontier is haunted by a variety of strange and mysterious denizens. The local Ojibwe, Cree, and Oji Cree First Nations whose ancestors have called the region home since time immemorial, have long maintained that their northern woods are the domain of a sinister entity called the Wendigo, Wendigo, or Wittico, variously described as a gaunt, preternatural giant with a craving for human flesh, or the spirit of that boreal demon, which imbues in the psyches of the vulnerable its own cannibalistic proclivities. Native legend contends that the lakes and rivers that crisscross the Canadian Shield, and particularly the rocky cliffs that fringe them, are home to little aquatic goblins, sometimes described as hairy dwarfs, and at other times characterized as long-haired sirens. The skies above this wild country are supposed to be frequented by a giant eagle with the ability to create thunder and lightning, while Lake Superior to the south is said to be patrolled by a colossal underwater lynx with preternatural power. Of all the legendary monsters said to haunt this vast and lonely wilderness, among the most obscure are the wild giants, supposed to be members of some large and ancient human tribe. In his 1995 book, Sacred Legends, Canadian folklorist James R. Stevens included several traditional OG Cree giant stories told to him by elders of the Sandy Lake First Nation in northwestern Ontario. One of these tales is set on the shores of Deer Lake, a remote body of water about 60 kilometers or 37 miles southwest of the Sandy Lake Reserve. For many years, the story begins, the Indians on Deer Lake were plagued by a race of strange giant men. These monsters would come in the winter and would destroy their villages, killing and raping the Indians at will. Some of the braves would fight them when they came, but arrows had no effect on the giants they could not be killed. 
After an especially devastating raid, the men of Deer Lake held a powwow in their medicine lodge, determined to resolve their untenable situation. One young warrior suggested that the band quit the country and flee to the west. His proposal was countered by a veteran brave, who spurned the idea of abandoning the homeland of his ancestors, and argued that the region to the west was occupied by hostile tribes who would give them as much trouble as the giants did. After some time, the oldest man in the tribe, an elder named Musque, respected for his wisdom, who had hitherto sat in silence, smoking his pipe, declared that he had learned the secret of the giant's invulnerability in a dream the previous night. In his dream, he saw the village of the giants, which lay on a riverbank a seven days' journey from their own camp. Within the village was a nest where the giants kept their own beating hearts, safe from the knives and arrows of their Indian enemies. Destroy the hearts, Musque said, and we will be rid of the giants forever. Although most of the warriors dismissed Musque's vision as a wishful nocturnal reverie, one fat boy stood up and declared that he would take it upon himself to find the village of which the elder had dreamed. Although his peers laughed him out of the medicine lodge, deriding him for his weak constitution and his lack of skill as a hunter, the fat boy resolutely retrieved his bow and arrows and headed into the wilderness on Snowshoe, following Musque's directions. After seven days of constant traveling, the fat boy espied a cluster of tall lodges standing atop a hill overlooking the river. At the edge of this camp was an elevated platform on which reposed a quantity of huge beating hearts, red, glistening, and steaming in the cold. The boy withdrew his bow and sent arrow after arrow into the living organs. When the arrows pierced the hearts, Stevens wrote, great moans and cries of agony came from around the camp. Everywhere, giants were dropping dead in their footsteps. Then a giant came running across the ground to the nest. He had understood why his brothers and sisters were dying. When he got to the top of the scaffold, an arrow from the fat boy found his heart, and he crumpled to the ground. The fat warrior shot arrows into all the hearts, killing the whole tribe of giants. Then he descended the platform, and extinguished the campfires of the giants forever. There are two more giant stories in Stephen's book, each featuring a legendary hero and trickster figure called Jackabash, or Poke in the Eye. These stories indicate that the giants were more numerous in the ancient past, and that they enjoyed eating the natives whom they killed in battle. Giant legends also appear in American anthropologist Robert A. Brightman's 1989 book on the oral traditions of the Rock Cree of Granville Lake, Manitoba. Stories featuring a legendary hero called Kakapis, whom Brightman identifies as a swampy Cree variant of the Ojibwe Jacobesh, describe a race of huge wild men called Mistapawak. The Mistapawak are portrayed as enormous men of immense strength, who travel alone or in pairs, abducting native women and hunting native men. In addition to the aforementioned Wendigo and cliff-dwelling murdwarfs, there are at least two more humanoid monsters whom native legend says once abode in the wilderness of the Canadian Shield. In their 1962 book, Ojibwe Myths and Legends, Sister Bernard Coleman, Ellen Frogner, and Estelle Ike describe a legendary figure they call the Wild Man of the Woods. There is a man in buckskin who goes about the lakes and woods, they wrote. And then he is gone. Sometimes people hear a whistle, or they hear their names called, but the minute they turn around, the man of the wild woods is gone. Or a rack of tools might fall over, but no one is there. A few people say that they have seen him, and that sometimes he has smiled, but only for a second, and then he is gone. Some say he is a spirit, who's trying to get himself back into human form. A fourth class of legendary human-like monster, said to have once prowled the forest north of the Great Lakes, is a race of primitive human, referred to collectively as the Hairy Hearts, or the Hairy Breasts. These wild and robust people are said to have once waged perpetual war against their Cree and Ojibwe neighbors, killing men and kidnapping women. They did not make use of the bow and arrow, but rather hunted their game and attacked their enemies by running them down, tackling them, and tearing them open with stone knives. 
Most versions of this ancient legend contend that native warriors wiped out these Stone Age predators long ago. Just as legendary wild men do not appear to be especially important elements of Cree and Ojibwe oral tradition, modern sightings of hairy wild men in the forests of northern Ontario are relatively scant. There is, however, one intriguing case which appears in classic Bigfoot literature, indicating that the old Cree and Ojibwe legends of wild giants, preternatural wild men, and primitive humans might be more than fireside fairy tales. This case consists of four eerily consistent sightings, set in the same unassuming corner of civilization. The oldest of the four, separated from the latest by a span of 64 years. In the heart of the desolate expanse of boreal forest and Precambrian rock, which separates eastern and western Canada, lies the tiny town of Cobalt, Ontario, the living relic of an early 20th century silver rush, for which it served as the hub. Back in 1903, following two silver strikes made by contractors engaged in the construction of the Temiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway, Canadian and American prospectors began to trickle into the area establishing the boom town of Cobalt at the site of one of the original discoveries. By the outbreak of the Great War, when the stampede began to abate, the surrounding silver fields had yielded over 32 million ounces of raw argentic treasure. In September 1906, at the height of the Cobalt Silver Rush, a group of men tasked with building the head frame or winding tower of the Violet Mine just east of the Cobalt Camp are said to have spotted a huge, hairy man watching them from partial concealment in the trees. Word of this disturbing event spread quickly throughout the silver fields and embedded itself in local memory. We owe our knowledge of this regrettably vague report to a handful of articles published years later in the North Bay Nugget, North Bay, Ontario being the nearest city to Cobalt, located 145 kilometers or 90 miles to the south. The articles came into the possession of Canadian Sasquatch researcher René de Hinden, who sent them to his friend and counterpart John Green, who in turn published them in his 1971 book, On the Track of Sasquatch. Seventeen years after the sighting at the Violet Mine, the Wild Man of Cobalt made a second appearance, this time near the Wet Laufer Mine, the latter lying about 25 kilometers or 16 miles southeast of Cobalt. According to an article in the July 27, 1923 issue of the North Bay Nugget, in which the story of the 1906 sighting was published for the first time, and in the greatest detail, miners J.A. McCauley and Lorne Wilson were working their claims northeast of the Wetlawfer Mine, presumably near the southwestern shores of Lake Temiskaming, when they noticed what they first took to be a black bear, sitting in a blueberry patch, picking fruit from the bush. Wilson threw a rock at the hairy creature, prompting it to stand up on two legs and growl at him. The figure then darted into the forest and out of sight, running on two legs like a human. It sure was like no bear that I have ever seen, Wilson told reporters. Its head was kind of yellow, and the rest of it was black like a bear, all covered with hair. The newspaper described the creature as ape-like, and reported that locals had named it Yellow Top on account of its light-colored mane. It is worth noting that this article predates the famous and sensational reports of the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest, which began with J.W. Burns' famous article for the April 1929 issue of Maclean's magazine, precluding any influence of the latter. The yellow-headed wildman of the Canadian Shield made its third appearance in the Cobalt area in 1946, 23 years after the 1923 sighting. This time, the witnesses were a mother and son who lived at Gillies Depot, a settlement which had sprung up around a railway station and section house of the Temiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway about seven kilometers or four miles southwest of Cobalt. About a half mile east of Gillies Depot, the railroad runs along the shores of a small body of water called Gillies Lake, not to be confused with the pond of the same name, which lies at the northeastern end of Timmins, Ontario, about 164 kilometers or 100 miles to the northwest. It was at the southern edge of Gillies Lake that the sighting took place. Old Yellowtop declared a peace in the April 16, 1946 issue of the North Bay Nugget. The half-man, half-beast that is supposed to be roaming the wilds around the Cobalt mining camp 
was reportedly seen again, this time by a woman and her son, who lived near Gilly's Depot, while they were walking the tracks into Cobalt. The woman, who did not want her name made public, said that she spotted a dark, hairy animal with a light head ambling off the tracks into the bush near Gilly's Lake. She said she did not get a clear look at the thing, but said that it walked almost like a man. The article concluded with a declaration that a search party may be formed to try and find Old Yellowtop. To the best of this author's knowledge, the hopeful monster hunt never got underway. With the possible exception of a vague roadside sighting alluded to in the North Bay Nugget, the fourth and most dramatic encounter with Old Yellowtop took place one evening in the summer of 1970 on the gravel road to the Cobalt Load Mine, about five kilometers or three miles southwest of town. That night, driver Amy Latre was conveying a busload of 27 miners consigned to the graveyard shift, repeating a commute he had made nearly every evening for the past four months when a dark figure loomed from the roadside forest before him and lumbered into the glare of his high beams. At first I thought it was a big bear, the tray told a reporter, whose story was published on the August 5, 1970 issue of The Nugget. But then it turned to face the headlights, and I could see some light hair, almost down to its shoulders. It couldn't have been a bear. Latre slammed on the brakes, sending the bus into a wild fishtail, which nearly resulted in a fatal plunge off a cliff, and allowing the mysterious pedestrian an opportunity to complete its crossing and vanish into the trees on the other side of the road. When later asked to identify the creature, Latre simply stated, I have heard of this thing before, but never believed it. Now I'm sure. He added that he was less sure whether he would continue to drive the bus to the Cobalt Load Mine. Latre's account was echoed by the testimony of one of his passengers, a miner named Larry Cormack. It looked like a bear to me at first, Cormack told a reporter, but it didn't walk like one. It was kind of half stooped over. Maybe it was a wounded bear. I don't know. When asked whether he thought the creature might have been Old Yellowtop, which the paper alternately referred to as the Precambrian Shield Man, Cormac said, My father used to talk about it, but I've seen it close up. The reporter ended his story with a quip that the mysterious pedestrian might have been a rowdy patron from a local saloon, which John Green took as an indication that the newspaper, at least, regarded the story as a hoax. This sentiment was confirmed by Green's associate, Bill Davis, who made inquiries at the Nugget office and learned that the journalists there regarded the tale as a miner's prank. In their 1999 book, The Field Guide to Bigfoot, Yeti, and Other Mystery Primates Worldwide, in which they separate the various legendary wild men of the world into taxonomic classes of their own devising, cryptozoologists Lauren Coleman and Patrick Wieg placed Old Yellowtop into a genus they called Mark Tominid. In their outline of this taxonomic class, they explained that the term Mark Tominid has a double meaning, deriving from the Christian name of Mark A. Hall, the cryptozoologist who first identified the unique traits of the supposed wild man subclass, which he initially christened Taller Hominids, as well as from the Mansi word, Masheni, or Marked One, a local nickname for a hairy wild man from western Siberia, whose reddish-brown coat was marred by an anomalous patch of white fur, covering the left forearm. Like the Masheni, members of the marked hominid class are distinguished by their two-toned or multicolored hair patterns, which Old Yellowtop, with his dark coat and yellow mane, clearly displayed. It is worth noting that Old Yellowtop shares this singular attribute with the so-called Traverspine Gorilla, another supposed wild man spotted at the eastern edge of a Canadian shield in the wilds of Labrador, which witnesses described as having a shock of white hair on the crown of its head. Other characteristics shared by members of the marked hominid subclass are their native subarctic range and roughly seven foot tall stature. Incredibly, Old Yellowtop is not the only mysterious creature said to lurk on the outskirts of Cobalt, Ontario. Just east of town, straddling the border of Ontario and Quebec, is a long, deep body of water called Lake Temiskaming, which legend says is home to a monster known as the Mugwump. But that's a story for another time. In the desolate heart of the Canadian Shield, the sparsely populated expanse of boreal forest and Precambrian rock that stretches from the highlands of eastern Labrador 
to the woods of northern Saskatchewan, lies Cobalt, Ontario, a remote town of a thousand souls. Born out of an early 20th century silver rush, this isolated enclave of humanity has produced a startling variety of strange stories since its 1906 genesis, which were diligently documented by Canadian writer John Robert Colombo in his 1999 book, Mysteries of Ontario. Foremost among these is the legend of Old Yellow Top, a flaxen-headed wild man said to haunt the surrounding forest. Spotted in 1906, 1926, 1946, and 1970, which we explored in the previous piece. The oldest story Colombo relates is set back in 1896, seven years before the Cobalt Silver Rush. At that time, the region's only human inhabitants were Cree and Ojibwe natives, Hudson's Bay Company employees of the surrounding Forts Metatuan, Domiscomingue, and Tamagami, oblate missionaries, seasonal lumberjacks, and a few French-Canadian settlers who had begun to take up residence just east of the Quebec border. Legend has it that one of the new arrivals to the region was a mysterious young French-Canadian artist named Henri Alt, who established a studio in the area. That spring, Alt painted a daytime scene of Christ standing on the shores of the Dead Sea, a painting which some harsher critics might dismiss as relatively unremarkable were it not for an extraordinary metamorphosis it undergoes in the absence of light. Upon entering his studio one night, one version of the legend contends, Alt was astonished to discover that this painting had assumed a miraculous aspect in the dark. The divine subject had transformed into a statue-like silhouette with lifelike three-dimensional attributes, whose robes billowed as if subject to a gentle breeze. The celestial background had taken on a luminous hue as of a sky on a moonlit night. Behind Christ's head was a halo which actually seemed to radiate light, which some witnesses have since likened to the soft glow of moonlight. Perhaps most eerily, the dark shadow of a cross appeared plainly and distinctly behind Christ's left shoulder, at a spot where Alt had only painted plain blue sky. This sensational and mysterious work of art, dubbed the Shadow of the Cross, was subsequently displayed at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. In 1910 and 11, it was showcased in the Doré Gallery on London, England's Bond Street, alongside the masterpieces of French artist Gustave Doré. Here, it was purportedly examined by British chemist and physicist Sir William Crookes, who could find no evidence of phosphorescent or radioactive paint which might account for its baffling luminous characteristic. The painting eventually made its way to Atlanta, Georgia, where it was purchased by a wealthy Texan named Mrs. Herbert Sidney Griffin. Griffin, in turn, donated the piece to the San Francisco de Assis Mission Church, a historic Spanish colonial church in Rancho de Taos, New Mexico, where it remains to this day. A third cobalt mystery came to national attention in the twilight of the cobalt silver rush. In the autumn of 1931, Cobalt miners William Forrest, Frank Wilder, and Tom Powers reported that the eerie airs of a stringed instrument issued at night from an abandoned cabin on the shores of Baptiste Lake, about 63 miles or 102 kilometers northwest of Cobalt, incidentally near the ruins of the old Hudson's Bay Company's Fort Metatuan. Local natives claimed that this ramshackle hut belonged to a chief who had died there in the early 1920s and who was known to have played the harp in life. Inside the cabin, the miners found a fiddle with broken strings, which the late chief had kept near his bed. Of all the mysteries to come out of this remote corner of civilization, one of the most interesting is that of the aquatic monster said to haunt Lake Temiskaming, a long, narrow body of water which straddles the border between Ontario and Quebec, whose name means deep waters and whose shore lies about four miles or seven kilometers northeast of Cobalt. Referred to as Lac Tomiscomingue by the French-speaking residents of its eastern shores, this lower extension of the Ottawa River served as the southernmost stretch of an ancient canoe road connecting James Bay, the southern appendage of Hudson Bay, with the watershed of the Great Lakes. This aquatic highway was first traversed by whites in the spring of 1686, when the wilderness of what is now northern Ontario was populated by the members of two competing fur companies. To the north was Rupert's Land, the watershed of Hudson Bay, on the gloomy shores of which the 16-year-old British Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, 
built its frozen palisade fortresses. To the south was the Pays d'Ao, the watershed of the Great Lakes, patrolled by independent French Coureurs des Bois and agents of the four-year-old Compagne du Nord. Despite that the British King Charles II and the French monarch Louis XIV at that time were reveling in what historian Francis Parkman Jr. described as a time of profound peace, the French syndicate had waged an aggressive campaign against its British rival since its inception, hoping to stem the flow of furs to the north. After the establishment of a trading post called Fort St. Anne on a now vanished island in Lake Temiskaming at the mouth of the Montreal River, a company of French Marines and French Canadian militiamen under the command of Captain Pierre de Troyes, Chevalier de Troyes, traveled north up the lake and further north through the bush, launching what historian Peter C. Newman described as one of North America's earliest and most successful commando assaults on the forts of the Hudson's Bay Company. At the time of this so-called Hudson's Bay expedition, the route between Hudson Bay and the Ottawa River was an uncharted wilderness in which no portage routes had yet been cut. The trail that de Troyes and company blazed would not be widely used for at least another hundred years, being reopened during the turbulent spell of competition between the HBC and its new arch-rival, the Northwest Company. This grueling brigade route continued to be traversed by HBC voyageurs throughout the 1800s, being one of two trails which connected the Great Lakes with the frozen sea for which the company was named. In 1933, decades after this primitive trail had fallen out of general use, an old HBC voyageur who had plied a portion of this path in its waning years penned what might be the first reference to an ancient belief that Lake Temiskaming is haunted by some mysterious entity. In April 1933, a two-part story appeared in the Haleyburyan, a newspaper based out of the town of Haleybury, Ontario, now part of Temiskaming Shores. The author wrote under the pseudonym Shakonash, a variation of the Algonquian word Sheganash, which means white man. The story, entitled A Canoe Trip to Fort Temiskamingue in 79, appears to be a true account of a routine HBC round trip from Fort Metachuan to Fort Temiskamingue the latter lying on the eastern shores of the narrowest part of the lake, just south of present-day Ville-Marie, Quebec. This piece offers rare insight into the culture of the HBC in Northern Ontario in the late 1800s, and into the daily minutiae which attended the life of a late 19th century voyageur. After chronicling the canoe trip down the Montreal River, the author described his party's entrance into Lake Temiskaming. When we came down to the big steep rocks on the west side, he wrote, the Indian crews had a great talk in their own language, and everyone who used tobacco put a little in the water in front of the steep rocks, the writer adding his quote with the rest. I never learned the real significance of the performance, but anyone who passed on the lake with a loaded canoe in front of those rocks will know that it was very advisable to court the favor of the water sprite. The water sprite, supposed to haunt these steep cliffs fronting the southwestern shores of Lake Temiskaming, a vista which French-Canadian Bishop Monsignor Narcisse Zephyrin Lorraine likened to the famous fjord-like slopes of Quebec's Saguenay River, was almost certainly a specimen of what local natives called the Memaguese, the subject of a strange native legend shared by First Nations across the continent. These mystical figures were described as hairy dwarves or long-haired sirens, their descriptions varying slightly from tribe to tribe. They were universally supposed to be endowed with preternatural power, particularly the ability to conjure storms and strong winds, and were said to inhabit the rocky cliffs which fringe lakes and rivers. From the Mi'kmaq of New Brunswick to the interior Salish of British Columbia, native peoples the country over offered gifts of tobacco to these mysterious beings in order to ensure their safe passage through their waters. Such concerns were not unwarranted on Lake Temiskaming, where poor weather can have deadly consequences. For example, on June 13, 1978, 13 young canoeists from Claremont, Ontario, who had dreams of replicating Pierre de Trois' 1686 expedition to James Bay, drowned in the frigid waters of Lake Temiskaming, about 7 miles or 11 kilometers southeast of the mouth of the Montreal River. There is another cliff overlooking Lake Temiskaming, which is said to have a long association with the mysterious murdwarves of native legend. About 11 miles or 18 kilometers northwest of Old Fort Temiskamingue, at the section of the lake closest to Cobalt, 
is a granite escarpment known as Devil's Rock, or Manadu Ajabikong in Ojibwe. Over the years, Devil's Rock has borne witness to several uncanny events befitting its sinister appellation. Just east of the cliff, in the middle of the lake, is a piece of land called Burnt Island, or Eel Man, where two five-year-old children were lost for five days in the wilderness, in the same week of the same month, exactly 25 years apart from each other. The first of the children to disappear, namely little Grace Cooper, who wandered away from her family's campground in August 1913, declared after her rescue that she had set out to find Devil's Rock. Predictably, this demonic-sounding landmark attracted the interest of English occultist Alistair Crowley, who suspected that it might be imbued with dark, otherworldly power. In 1929, he is said to have climbed the granite face with the aim of finding Ojibwe pictographs, which he believed to be markers denoting a connection with the underworld. In the process, the occultist purportedly lost a chalk stone, a piece of climbing equipment, in a fissure in a rocky appendage, ironically known as the Finger of God. There are several stories which purport to explain the origin of Devil Rock's diabolical name. According to the tale apparently favored by the North Bay Nugget, a newspaper servicing the southerly city of North Bay, Ontario, the cliff's naming was connected in some way to an old legend in which an Indian princess leapt to her death from the Promontory's Heights after being denied marriage to the brave of her choice. How the Manitou features in this legend, the Nugget has never deigned to explain. In the summer of 1984, Nugget reporter Gord McCullough published an old logger's fable which holds that Devil's Rock is Satan's wife, whose infernal spouse turned her to stone on their honeymoon after he tired of her. A French-Canadian version of this story appears in Joan Finnegan's 1984 book, Laughing All the Way Home. Some say that the rock owes its name to a craggy ledge overlooking the lake, which, like New Hampshire's more famous Old Man in the Mountain, resembles the face of an elderly gentleman in side profile, gazing out over the water. And according to Backroads Bill Steer, a professor at Nipissing University and founder of the Canadian Ecology Centre, the rock was named after the Mamakwashawak, or Rock Demons almost certainly a variant of the legendary Memagwe, whom local natives traditionally believe dwelled in its caves and fissures. As the story goes, Steer wrote in an April 12, 2023 article for the website northontario.travel, the natives surprised the little inhabitants of the many rock crevices, and the raiding party captured one of the gnomes and his knife. As the Ojibwe people withdrew, one of the remaining diminutive spirits retreated inside a deep crevice, and created such fearsome noises that his captors threw back the stolen knife towards the opening of the crevice they believed was the entry to the underworld. On April 20th, 1979, an article appeared in the North Bay Nugget, alleging that Lake Temiskaming is home to another sort of monster, a huge creature that lurked beneath the surface. The components of the Tri-Town area to which the article refers were the northern Ontario towns of New Liskeard, Haleybury, and Diamond which were amalgamated in 2004 into the town of Temiskaming Shores. There are rumors circulating throughout the Tritown area, the article began, that a creature similar to the one inhabiting Loch Ness in Scotland is living in Lake Temiskaming. The article goes on to explain that this incredible notion was brought to the attention of local journalists by New Liskeard's mayor, Jack Dent, who claimed to have originally heard the story from a native elder from the Wabi River, which drains into the lake's northwestern end. The old Indian claimed that the creature was supposed to be as long as four men, arranged from head to foot, but had never been seen in its entirety. The legend was later borne out by tales of fishermen getting fish finder readings of a hulking object moving slowly beneath their boats. The mayor claimed that most sightings of the creature had been made in a deep channel near Burnt Island, and also near Devil's Rock, where the water is reported to be more than 700 feet deep. Another popular haunt was supposed to be a stretch of water off the town of Ville Marie, not far from the old fort to Miskamingue. Dench took it upon himself to dub the creature Mugwump, an old Algonquian word which means Great One. The piece in the North Bay Nugget touched off a series of newspaper articles throughout northern Ontario, many containing the new report of an old sighting, made months, years, or even decades prior, which had presumably been kept private for reasons of social self-preservation. Researcher Craig Heinzelman diligently collected these reports and referenced them in his article for the January 2007 issue of the Biofortian Review.
Perhaps the oldest encounters with the Mugwump, which did not make it into newsprint, are the strange experiences purportedly had by HPC voyageurs. In his 2002 book, Deep Waters, author James Raffin notes that Lake Temiskaming is bisected by a geological fault line, which runs down the length of the Ottawa River. He proposes that the seismic rumblings, which this fracture occasionally produced, gave voyageurs cause for worry, adding a certain mystery to the already numinous and at times forbidding character of the lake. There are also stories, Raffin continued, of mysterious bumpings on the bottom of canoes during the hourly pipes, when voyageurs would rest on Lake Temiskaming. Some thought these might have been hermetic drumfish that would congregate in the shadows of the canoes, following them surreptitiously from north to south and back again, piscine agents of the mysterious lake sprites. Others ascribed more sinister origins to the sound. The oldest 20th century mugwump report to make it into the papers was provided by an elderly woman named Kate Ardtree, who gave her testimony to journalist Alice Peeper in early 1982. Although Ardtree was the resident of a local nursing home at the time, she had spent most of her life living in a cottage at the edge of Lake Temiskaming, where her father used to tell her tales of the monster that lurked beneath. The creature was said to resemble a massive sturgeon, with a body the length of two canoes, and with a strange-looking head. In the old days, it would sometimes surface along with air bubbles that escaped from underwater fissures. Its lair was believed to lie off Dawson's Point, the peninsula which furrows the lake's northern shore. One day, when she was a girl, perhaps in the 1910s or 20s, Ardtree claimed that her father came home with one of the creature's scales, which was as large as a tea saucer. The elderly woman admitted that she had never seen the monster herself, and was glad that she hadn't. The next oldest mugwump story comes from John Cobb, a then 83-year-old former tugboat captain who had worked atop Lake Temiskaming for nearly 50 years, who told his tale to reporter Darian Rowe in August 1995. In the early 1940s, when he was a lowly deckhand, Cobb routinely helped pull timber rafts from the Blanche River at the lake's northernmost tip to the Narrows just south of Ville Marie. One night while on duty, he came on the deck of the steam-powered Lady Minto just in time to see a 20-foot-long creature resting just beneath the water's surface. He recalled that the strange swimmer had a rounded head and a nose like a land animal. I didn't know what it was, he told Roe. When we come up close, it disappeared. The Mugwump was reportedly seen again in the early 1960s by one Chuck Cool, who gave his story to journalist Mike Pearson in 1979. Cool's sighting allegedly took place while he and his father were returning home from a boating excursion to Burnt Island, just east of Devil's Rock. Although Craig Heinzelman, in his summary of Pearson's elusive article, did not specify the location of Cool's home, the destination of their excursion, and their Scottish, or more precisely non-French surname, hint that the father and son probably lived in Haleybury or New Liskeard, Ontario, placing their sighting at the northwestern end of the lake. We were cruising around in the boat, about a third of the way back from Burnt Island, Cool said, when we saw what looked like a dead head. We pulled up to it. It rolled over and swam away. It was the biggest sturgeon you've ever seen. I'd been hearing about the thing all my life. Upon further prompting, Cool estimated the fish to be about eight feet long. More than a decade later, in 1978, the monster of Lake Temiskaming surfaced again, this time within view of the bygone Matabenic Hotel in Haleybury, Ontario, on the lake's northwestern shore. While seated in the hotel dining room, guests Ernie Chartrand and his wife spotted something large in the water, moving towards the shore at a blistering pace. As it was nearing the water's edge, the creature did an abrupt about-face, revealing a large humped back without a fin. The maneuver also afforded the couple a clear view of the creature's length, which they estimated to be about 15 feet. In February 1982, Cobalt residents Roger Lapointe and retired RCMP officer Dan Arney allegedly came face to face with a mugwump while doing some nighttime ice fishing on Lake Temiskaming. According to an article written by the aforementioned Alice Paper, 
LaPointe and Arnie were hunkered down in one of their friend's ice shanties, when some huge fish below took both pieces of bait and sheared both of their lines. Baffled, the anglers reset their lines, cracked some beers, and waited for the next bite. About half an hour later, they were rewarded for their efforts by a tremendous jerk, which wrested both of their fishing rods from their holds and pulled them down the ice hole, where they vanished into the black water. Disgusted by their misfortune, the pair prepared to pack it in for the night, when a peculiar sensation overcame Arnie, a sensation that had served him well in the force. The former Mountie knew that something, or someone, was watching him. He reached out, Peeper wrote, and put a silencing grip on his partner's arm, and they began to survey the half-dark interior of the hut. Looking down, they saw two protruding eyeballs peering up at them from a glistening black head, which had forced itself up through the ice hole. The men beat a hasty retreat to their snowmobile and raced for the safety of the shore. The last and most incredible Mugwump report brought to public attention appeared in the same article as the previous story. At the end of the piece, Alice Peeper included the account of John Shure of New Liskeard, another ice fisherman, who claimed he heard a crunching sound one night while locking up his shanty. Knowing that he was the only fisherman still out on the lake, Peeper wrote, he decided to see what it was about. Thinking it was probably a dog, he almost walked into a long, dark animal that seemed to be wrapped about several of the huts and was chewing something. Shore stated that the creature looked something like a dinosaur, but disclaimed that he did not stay for a second look, instantly fleeing on his snowmobile. Desperate to find someone who might verify his sighting, he paid a visit to a local hotel and secured the assistance of two men, who accompanied him back to the ice. The only evidence of the creature the newcomers managed to find was a snake-like trail in the snow. In late February 1982, Mary Peeper published a disappointing article, which appears to be nothing less than the tipping of her hand, a cheeky admonition that her earlier pieces on the Mugwump, which included the testimonies of John Shure, Roger LaPointe and Dan Arney, and Kate Ardtree, might have been made of more fable than fact. In his article for the Biofortian Review, Craig Heinzelman identified Mary Peeper as one of several pseudonyms used by Ada Arney, a cobalt-based author and journalist, whom readers may observe shares a surname with one of the aforementioned ice fishermen. Another nom de plume she affected was the, apparently, Spanish-German-Scottish Dr. Pablo von McDonnell, a multicultural chimera so outlandish that it must have been crafted for comedic purposes. In an article attributed to Dr. von McDonnell, published on the February 24, 1982 issue of the Temiskaming Speaker, three alleged experts voiced their opinion on the identity of the monster of Lake Temiskaming. The first of these scholars was Dr. Boris Ilyich Rubikon Skuberinov, a professor of psychobiology at the fictional Karl Marx College in the fictional town of Bolshevik in the fictional country of Russi. He argued that the monster of Lake Temiskaming was probably a beluga sturgeon, whose ancestors were imported as caviar to Russian ports in Alaska and somehow made their way inland. Another expert was Dr. Johannes Liebig von Brusthalter, a professor of macrobiology at the Max Planck Institute in the fictional city of Esseldorf, West Germany. Finally, there was I. Haggis Campbell, the director of the Institute for Psychic Studies near Edinburgh, Scotland, who opined that the Mugwump is a specimen of Loch Ness Monster, whose ancestors were brought from Scotland to Canada as microscopic eggs. There is a Scottish tradition that endured throughout the Highland Clearances, Campbell explained, in which emigres taking leave of Old Caledonia would bring a sample of their native soil with them to their new country. Some of the earth brought by Scottish immigrants to the Lake Temiskaming region, Campbell reasoned, was from Loch Ness and contained the microscopic eggs of Loch Ness monsters. Dr. Vaughn MacDonald concluded his piece by revealing that his real name was, in fact, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelty, an obvious nod to the author of the 1818 novel Frankenstein and claiming that he was a scientist in residence at the famed Inch Block in Cobalt, Ontario, the Inch Block being a historic Cobalt multi-purpose building. The same paper contained an article by Ada Arney, this one published under her pseudonym Mary Peeper, in which she claimed to be in correspondence with an anonymous biologist gracious enough to comment upon the monster of Lake Temiskaming. This nameless expert proposed that the Mugwump might be a huge ancient salamander called Ichthyostega. In a later article, published on the March 3, 1982 issue of the Temiskaming Speaker, 
This same biologist proposed another possible identity for the lake monster, namely a long-extinct plesiosaur called Elasmosaurus, which sported a long neck, flippers, and a fish-like tail. Although Ada Arney's last two articles on the Mugwump diminish the credibility of her work on the topic, the accounts of Ernie and Mrs. Chartrand, who spotted something unusual from Haleybury's Matabenic Hotel, Chuck Cool and his father, who came upon a huge sturgeon near Devil's Rock, and respected tugboat captain John Cobb, who saw a 20-foot-long fish with a bestial head in the 1940s, have no such stains on their character. Taken together, these sightings suggest that there may really be an unusual animal living in Lake Temiskaming, which they paint the picture of being an unusual-looking fish with a length of 8 to 20 feet. Most of those who have commented upon the creature, including some of the witnesses, have likened the mugwump to a sturgeon. In spite of this easy solution, it must be remembered that the largest lake sturgeon ever recorded, lake sturgeon or white sturgeon, being the only freshwater varieties of that species known to live in Canadian waters, was a 15-foot, 4-inch-long monster hauled from Manitoba's Rousseau River, a far cry from Captain Cobb's 20-foot-long behemoth. If the mugwump, or tessie as it is sometimes called today, is indeed a lake sturgeon, it appears to be the largest of its species by a wide margin. A potential explanation for this discrepancy, provided by an anonymous local fisherman, appears in a bygone French-language internet article, which serves as the introduction to a subchapter from Canadian author Joel Champetier's 1994 horror novel, Le Memoir du Lac. It comes around every year in July or early August, the article claims, referring to the mugwump. The hypothesis, these two months correspond to spawning time. According to a former commercial fisherman in the region, it is a lake sturgeon. According to him, people generally see it on calm, sunny days. As calm water has the physical property of doubling objects, the illusion would be complete. Witnesses would therefore see the fish twice its real size. The go-to reference books for unusual and mysterious lake monsters, namely George M. Eberhardt's 2010 tome, Mysterious Creatures, A Guide to Cryptozoology, and Lauren Coleman and Patrick Weig's 2003 classic, The Field Guide to Lake Monsters, Sea Serpents, and Other Mystery Denizens of the Deep, have surprisingly little to say on the monster of Lake Temiskaming, simply listing the creature as a lake monster supposed to reside in Ontario, Canada. Indigenous folklore is less silent on the matter, having at least one traditional story about an enormous fish which dwelled in a lake in northern Ontario. It is perhaps fitting that we end our piece with this oldest of Mugwump stories, a humorous tale which was told around northern campfires long before the Chevalier des Trois first dipped his paddle into Lake Temiskaming. In his 1995 book, Sacred Legends, Canadian folklorist James R. Stevens included an O.G. Cree story told to him by elders of the Sandy Lake First Nation in northwestern Ontario about a huge fish encountered by Jacobache, a legendary Ojibwe hero and trickster figure. According to this brief fable, Jacobache and his sister once lived beside a lake that was home to a huge fish. Contrary to the advice of his sister, who feared this freshwater leviathan, Jacobache tested a batch of new arrows he made by shooting them out over the lake. When he swam to retrieve them, the giant fish swallowed him in one gulp. Jacobache's sister, unaware of what had befallen her younger brother, and supposing that he had gone off on another of his adventures, busied herself with catching fish. As fate would have it, she managed to catch the monster of which she had long been afraid, which seemed even a little bigger than usual. She took the fish home, Stephen's informant told him, and cut open their bellies to put them in the cook pot. When she cut open the belly of the big fish, Jacobace jumped out, very much alive. At first the sister was frightened, and then she started to laugh at the dirty Jacobace. He was covered with fish entrails. I told you, I told you, she laughed. But Jacobache said nothing, and walked to the water's edge to clean himself. There are certain places where the veil between our mortal plane and the great beyond appears to be paper-thin, where locals learn to live with resident spirits, and apparitions from a bygone age are regarded as sporadic constants, as steadfast as the ancient buildings they inhabit. The infamous Tower of London, for example, where a thousand years of anguish seem to be seared into the very stones, 
is said to be haunted by a host of noble spirits, from the pair of Plantagenet princes who vanished under the protection of King Richard III, to the headless specter of Anne Boleyn, the ill-fated Tudor Queen. In Savannah, Georgia, where dark echoes of war, epidemic, piracy, and voodoo seem to permeate the atmosphere, shadowy figures from another era are spotted strolling through historic squares or lingering in storied inns, sometimes laying their icy fingers on the arms of passersby in desperate bids for acknowledgement. Canada has its own purported hotspots of paranormal activity. Some say that the most active is the charming town of Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, a historic settlement nestled at the quiet southern tip of the Golden Horseshoe, where the Niagara River meets Lake Ontario, just west of the New York border. At the eastern end of town, with its epicenter at the junction of King and Queen Street, is a roughly five-block area where every third or fourth building seems to have its own resident ghost story. Tales of love, sacrifice, triumph, and tragedy. These folk tales transport us back to some of the most turbulent spells of Canadian history. Join me as I explore the most haunted locations in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Canada's most haunted town. Many of Niagara-on-the-Lake's best ghost stories are set during the War of 1812, a small but impactful military conflict fought between British Canada and the United States. In order to appreciate these tales, some historical context is required. The War of 1812 began in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars, in the aftermath of the French Emperor's disastrous invasion of Russia. Since its entry into that conflict in 1803, the British Royal Navy had accosted American merchant ships on the Atlantic and impressed any British-born deserters they found aboard into service, a practice which many Americans regarded as an insult to their national honor. In 1807, in response to Napoleon's trade embargo on Great Britain, King George III's Privy Council decreed that all American merchant ships bound for Europe must make their first stop in English ports so that they could be searched for military supplies which might find their way into French hands another perceived affront to American sovereignty. A third act of British aggression against the United States was its peaceful overtures to Tecumseh's Confederacy, an unlikely alliance of Algonquin, Iroquoian, and Siouan nations in the Great Lakes region, which hoped to carve a sovereign pan-Indian nation from American territory. Incensed by these indignities, a handful of belligerent young American congressmen, known as War Hawks, convinced their peers to declare war on Great Britain an action which might allow their fledgling nation to achieve its long-held objective of annexing Canada. Thus, on June 18th of that fateful year, the War of 1812 began. The Americans' first martial action was to move troops and equipment to Fort Detroit in preparation for an invasion of the British province of Upper Canada, which encompasses much of the present province of Ontario. Hoping to thwart the invasion before it took place, a daring British commander, Major General Isaac Brock, made an alliance with the great Shawnee chief Tecumseh, leader of the aforementioned Indian Confederacy, who had been at war with the United States Army for over a year. Through the use of false intelligence and illusory tactics, Brock and Tecumseh deceived the much larger American force at Fort Detroit into believing that they were a far more numerable and formidable fighting force than reality decreed. On August 16th, 1812, after enduring a brief artillery bombardment administered by the Redcoat besiegers, U.S. Brigadier General William Hull surrendered Fort Detroit to the British, eager to avert what he feared would be an Indian massacre. This stunning victory earned Brock a knighthood and the moniker Hero of Canada. Undaunted by this early defeat, the Americans mustered troops on the western shores of the Niagara River in preparation for a second invasion of Canada. Having received intelligence of this impending attack, Sir Isaac Brock relocated from the town of Amherstburg, near the junction of Lake Erie and the Detroit River, to Fort George, a palisaded military complex located at the mouth of the Niagara River. Just east of this installation was the town of Newark, formerly the capital of Upper Canada, and presently Niagara on the Lake. Brock was no stranger to Fort George, having made his first visit there in 1804 as a lieutenant colonel for the purpose of quelling a mutinous conspiracy. Legend has it that the officer was also intimately familiar with neighboring Newark, which he frequented when duty permitted. There, he purportedly developed an amorous relationship with Sophia Shaw, the daughter of Major General Aeneas Shaw, 
an officer in the Upper Canada Militia. Sophia, at that time, was living with her sister, Isabella, in a Newark manor. Isabella was married to militia officer Captain John Powell, who had built his stately home a short distance from the garrison back in 1809. Whenever Brock's duties allowed him some R&R in the Fort George area, the Powell family home was the site of many a happy rendezvous. After a respectable courtship, the 42-year-old Major General proposed to the 19-year-old Demoiselle, and the two became engaged, in one version of the story, without Aeneas's consent. In the early morning hours of October 13th, 1812, Isaac Brock awoke in his quarters at Fort George to the thunder of distant cannons rolling in from the south. He slipped on his field uniform, supplementing it with the red sash that Tecumseh had gifted him as a token of friendship, and ordered a detachment to investigate the commotion. Not content to wait for the detachment's report, the general mounted his horse and rode south to assess the situation himself. Legend has it that, before his departure, Brock made a quick visit to Captain Powell's house in order to see his beloved Sophia. While he sat in the saddle, his betrothed served him a stirrup cup of tea and bid him a fond farewell, swearing him to return to her once the business of the day was complete. Without further ado, the general galloped off towards the sounds of battle. Brock quickly learned that an American army, nearly three times the size of his 1,300-man Canadian Defense Force, was making its way across the Niagara River in rowboats. The British artillery battery atop Queenston Heights, a strategically important escarpment which overlooked the river, had rained a withering barrage upon the Yankee invaders, inflicting serious casualties. Despite this stiff resistance, the first wave of U.S. troops had reached the western shore, and, by way of a precarious cliffside trail, managed to capture the heights. Brock sent word to Fort George for as many reinforcements as could be spared. Rather than wait for fresh troops to arrive, the Major General, whose military career had hitherto been distinguished by a penchant for swift and stunning aggression, decided to retake Queenston Heights immediately. The commander dismounted, drew his saber, and led two companies of militia and British regulars in an impromptu charge uphill. Standing six foot four and bedecked in all his martial finery, Brock struck a dashing figure as he pressed the attack at the head of his troops. He also presented a large and gaudy target to the American infantrymen who had ensconced themselves behind trees and spiked cannons on the hill above, their muskets primed and cocked. During the ascent, one U.S. sharpshooter stepped out from behind cover and fired a double ball into Brock's chest. The celebrated hero of Canada died almost instantly. The initial British attempt to regain Queenston Heights was repulsed by the Americans. As reinforcements from Fort George continued to arrive, a party of Mohawk Braves, allied with the British, made a guerrilla-style assault on the promontory, screaming war whoops as they fired pot shots at the Yankees from concealment in the brush. Despite being completely bloodless, this firefight proved to be a devastating blow to the Americans, completely demoralizing the soldiers who had yet to cross the Niagara. In a remarkable repetition of the psychological warfare which won Brock and Tecumseh the Siege of Detroit, the warriors' chilling battle cries echoed across the river, freezing the blood of the U.S. militiamen who stood on the eastern shore. Defying the orders of their general, the Americans refused to enter the rowboats. Panic began to take hold of U.S. troops just as reinforcements arrived from Fort George. Within hours, the British had regained complete control of Niagara's western shores, winning another unlikely victory against a much larger American force. Legend has it that after the battle, a heartbroken Sophia Shaw, bereft of her gallant betrothed, fell into a deep despondency. She spent the rest of her days as a recluse in the home of Captain Powell, never marrying. Today, the Powell home is a charming bed and breakfast called Brockamore Manor its name being a reference to the romance that once blossomed beneath its roof, and which may still flourish there today. Some say that, true to his promise, the spirit of Isaac Brock returned to the manor after the Battle of Queenston Heights, to be reunited with Sophia's at her own earthly departure. Sophia is said to make her presence known to guests by singing near the top of the stairs, opening and closing doors at night, and materializing near her favorite armoire. One female guest who stayed in Sophia's old room reported waking up in the middle of the night to see the specter of a 19th-century lady 
standing at the foot of her bed, admonishing her with a disapproving glare. And every once in a while, a misty vision of a red-coated army officer and a Georgian lady clasped arm in arm is said to appear in the Rose Gardens before vanishing into thin air. The war plotted on after the Battle of Queenston Heights, the remainder of its first year being characterized by a third failed American invasion at Montreal and a succession of unexpected American naval victories on the high seas. In early 1813, British and Canadian militia move into the forests of Michigan Territory and, alongside Tecumseh's Braves, waged a ruthless campaign against the Americans. On April 27, 1813, 14 U.S. Navy warships, hastily constructed at Sackett's Harbor, New York, descended upon present-day Toronto, at that time the city of York. This capital of Upper Canada was located on the northwestern shores of Lake Ontario, about 30 miles or 48 kilometers northwest of Newark. A landing force of 1,700 American Army regulars quickly overwhelmed the city's 600-man garrison. During the retreat, the Redcoats detonated Fort York's powder magazine, killing several dozen American soldiers and U.S. General Zebulon Pike. In retaliation, the Yankees burned much of the city to the ground. After reorganizing at Fort Niagara, the U.S. military base located across the Niagara River from Newark, the Americans launched an assault on Fort George on May 25, 1813. For two days, American warships anchored in the Niagara River unleashed a cannon bombardment on Fort George, mercilessly barraging its bastions with heated shot. While the smoke cleared on the morning of May 27th, 4,000 U.S. soldiers disembarked on the shores of Lake Ontario to the northwest. Using grape shot to overwhelm the British soldiers who charged them with bayonets on the beach, the Yankees marched on Fort George. Unable to withstand the assault, the Redcoat defenders beat a hasty retreat to Burlington Heights, at the westernmost end of Lake Ontario, allowing the Americans to capture the fort, now little more than a smoking ruin, with few casualties. Considering the tumult of emotions that swirled within the walls of Fort George in the spring of 1813, it is perhaps not unsurprising that this historic relic serves as the setting for a number of chilling ghost stories. Many of these tales were documented by Kyle Upton, founder of the Ghost Tours of Niagara. Since 1994, Upton and his lantern-bearing, top-hat-wearing employees have guided ghost seekers on evening tours of the old fort, which was rebuilt in the 1930s by the Niagara Parks Commission. Their uncanny experiences led them to the conclusion that Fort George is home to several restless spirits, which Upton described in Volumes 1 and 2 of his book, Niagara's Ghosts at Fort George, published in 1999 and 2004, respectively. Upton's books are difficult to find. Fortunately, some of the stories he recorded were recounted in Maria da Silva and Andrew Hines' 2009 book, Ghosts of Niagara on the Lake, and the late Terry Boyle's 2015 publication, Haunted Ontario 4, Encounters with Ghostly Shadows, Apparitions, and Spirits. According to Hind and da Silva, one of the forlorn specters set to haunt Fort George is a sentry whom legend says froze to death on duty in the winter of 1811 having made the fatal error of mistaking his hypothermia-induced drowsiness for genuine sleepiness that might be remedied with a brief, unsanctioned snooze. From time to time, some say, the ghost of this unfortunate soldier can be seen dutifully pacing the sentry box in which he lost his life, his musket slung over one shoulder. Oftentimes, De Silva and Hyde wrote, only his upper torso was present, his legs disappearing into the parapet. Interestingly, this detail adds authenticity to sightings, since few would know that the bastion actually stands about three feet higher than it did in 1811. Other soldierly apparitions have been spotted throughout the fort. In the curving underground tunnel, which connects the powder magazine with a structure outside the fort called the Octagonal Blockhouse, tourists have encountered shadowy figures wearing bicorn or shako hats, whose boots can be heard on the hard-packed earthen floor. At night, fort employees have noticed solemn silhouetted men watching them from the windows of blockhouses 1 and 2, which stand side by side at the fort's northeastern face. In the officers' quarters, at the center of the fort, furniture and tableware are rearranged by unseen hands. And in the gift shop, a one-floor building, which once served the dual purpose of kitchen and hospice, footsteps can sometimes be heard pacing the phantom second story, which existed in the fort's heyday. The fort's most famous phantom, 
is a ghostly little girl who has been given the name Sarah Ann. Suspected to be the spirit of an officer's daughter who lived at Fort George in the early 1800s, this childish specter is said to play pranks on hapless tourists, giggling quietly to herself from various hiding places, like beneath an officer's bed or behind a piece of furniture, which, upon subsequent inspection, proved to be vacant. Those who have seen apparitions of this phantom, perhaps after having had their clothing tugged by small mischievous hands, have described her as a barefooted girl with curly blonde hair, clad in a white nightgown. Another ghost story connected with the Battle of Fort George is set in a charming English-style tavern called the Old Angel Inn, located near the junction of Niagara-on-the-Lake's Queen and Regent Streets. Initially named the Harmonious Coach House, this historic establishment has served locals and travelers alike since its construction in 1789. On that fateful day in the spring of 1813, as British troops retreated east along the shores of Lake Ontario, legend has it that Captain Colin Swayze, an officer in the Upper Canada Militia, broke away from his troops to visit the Harmonious Coach House, where he had been billeted for the past few months. The officer hoped to bid farewell to a certain barmaid with whom he had fallen in love. The star-crossed couple enjoyed a few tender moments together, but before the officer could steal away to join his regiment, American soldiers overran the inn. A panicked Captain Swayze, at the barmaid's advice, fled to the cellar and concealed himself within a barrel. In an effort to root out British deserters, American infantrymen searched every corner of the tavern. In the cellar, they thrust the bayonets affixed to the ends of their muskets into burlap sacks, dark recesses, and other potential hiding places. One soldier threw off the lid of the barrel in which Captain Swayze was hiding and plunged his bayonet into the lovesick officer. Colin Swayze quickly succumbed to his wound. An old legend, which the diary of an American militiaman indicates may date back to the autumn of 1813, purports that the ghost of Colin Swayze never left the cellar and haunts the Old Angel Inn to this very day. Guests staying in the Colonel's room have reported hearing strange noises in the night. Inn staff sometimes open the dining room in the morning to find furniture mysteriously rearranged. One guest claimed to have seen the face of the erstwhile captain in the mirror of the ladies' washroom. Although the officer's antics may frighten guests from time to time, local legend says that his spirit is harmless and will remain so for as long as British colors fly over the Old Angel Inn. To keep their resident spirit happy, the inn's many managers have long maintained the tradition of flying the Union Jack from the establishment's front door. During my own visit to the Old Angel Inn in November 2023, one of the establishment's present co-owners, a lovely lady named Kelly, who ordered me a plate of the best fish and chips I've ever had from the pub's English-style kitchen, filled me in on some of the strange things she and her employees have experienced in the historic building. On one occasion, while chatting in the bar with one of her co-workers, a bartender made some off-handed reference to tea. As she did so, a small metal teapot leapt off the wall hook from which it depended and clattered on the floor. A similar incident took place when the pub's chef burnt himself in the kitchen. No sooner had he done so than a first aid kit helpfully flew off the shelf to land at his feet. Another inanimate object propelled into motion by unseen hands was an old book which reposed on a high shelf in a room to the right of the inn's front entrance. In the presence of Kelly and other staff members, the book inexplicably tumbled to the floor, opened on its own, and riffled through its own pages, all in the absence of wind. Of all the strange occurrences to take place at the Old Angel Inn during Kelly's tenure, the strangest by far transpired at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, when the public house was locked down in accordance with federal mandates. On the night of September 5th, 2020, at 2.22 a.m., Kelly got a notification on her phone alerting her that the motion sensor camera mounted above the bar, which had been installed for security purposes, had picked up unexpected nighttime movement. When she reviewed the camera's picture bank, she was astonished to find the photo of a translucent white figure standing at the bar. Kelly's initial impression was that the camera had captured a ghostly apparition in the form of a human skeleton. Upon closer examination, however, the network of wispy strips that she had first taken for ribs and bones 
seemed to correspond perfectly with a golden embroidery, epaulets, and shoulder belt of a 19th century military officer's uniform. I actually felt a shiver run through me as Kelly directed my attention to the outline of the officer's face in side profile, complete with a distinct right eye and what appears to be either a chin strap or a deep nasolabial fold. Considering the inn's native ghost story, it is difficult to interpret this figure as anything other than the ghost of Captain Swayze, perhaps calling on his sweetheart at the bar, or simply thirsting for a pint. Captain Swayze's isn't the only spirit believed to haunt the Old Angel Inn. Several years ago, a bartender named Jane, along with the inn's chef, had a run-in with what appeared to be the ghost of a 19th century lady. Jane kindly related her experience for me on tape. For context, our interview took place at the inn's front desk. The following is Jane's story, in her own words. I spend a lot of time in this building by myself. And uh, especially like when we were in lockdown for COVID, I was here a lot of the time by myself because it was just for a while there, it was just myself and one of the, the other manager that was here at the time. I think that's your manager. And uh, one time that I, one day that I was working, uh, it was just me and I, one of the guys in the kitchen and I was taking a garbage bag out, to, out the side door to go out back. And as I was coming back in the building, I saw a woman standing out here and I, they looked so real that I actually said like, hey, I'll be right in. I'm just, I just got to close up here for one second. And by the time I made it through this doorway and out to where she was standing, I watched her float through the wall where the fireplace is that's right beside you here. And then I ran to the other side to see if she came out on the other side and there was nothing there. And not, on, not only did that happen, but I saw the same woman walk through the wall in the pub. And then a couple weeks later, they were we were looking at old photos from like the pub over the years, and the owner Kelly and myself were looking at pictures and found out that where she walked through the wall, there used to actually be a doorway there. So it's the same woman that I've seen several times to date now, and she has long dark hair and is wearing like a like a turn of the century like Victorian style like heavy gray dress, but I've seen her several times and I'm not the only person that has, so. When I asked Jane whether she had any notion as to the Phantom's identity, she replied, Uh, I have no idea, because as far as like the history of the building that I've heard, I've been here several years, and all that I've really heard is that Captain Swayze haunts the Angel Inn, but... I, I don't know. I have no idea. To date, I don't hear any stories of a woman being here, but there is one for sure, so. Another Lady in Grey is supposed to haunt the Breckenridge Holly Estate, a historic manor located about a 15-minute walk west of the Old Angel Inn. Built in 1796, this residence is said to be the permanent home of a friendly female ghost whose self-appointed purpose seems to be the maintenance of peace and good order in the house. Those who have seen her have described her as about 30 years old, with a slender waist, a kind, gentle face, a long, grey, mid-19th century dress, and a bonnet with the strings tied under her chin. Sometimes she appears as a full-body apparition, but more often she manifests as a grey, smoke-like haze. Nicknamed Elizabeth, this phantom is said to occasionally make her presence known by rapping on the heavy front door knocker or knocking on the back door. On one occasion, when the house's owners played host to guests who did not seem to appreciate their hospitality, Elizabeth is said to have showed her disapproval by slamming doors throughout the estate. Another resident of Niagara, as the city was called from 1814 until the year 1900, whom Elizabeth might have known in life, was Edward Clark Campbell, a one-time lawyer, judge, and Tory politician. In 1841, when Upper Canada and its easterly counterpart, Lower Canada, amalgamated into the province of Canada, Campbell was elected as a member of the Legislative Assembly. Following his death from pneumonia in January 18, 1860, Judge Campbell is said to have made a ghostly abode of his former office in Niagara's old courthouse, an antiquated stone building located about half a block away from the Old Angel Inn. According to Parks Canada employee Ron Dale, who managed the national historic sites throughout the Niagara region, and who once worked in Judge Campbell's old office. The 19th century justice had often lamented the stubborn chill that clung to his workplace, 
insightfully proclaiming that it would one day be the death of him. I always liked my room cold, said Dale of his office, in an interview with Hind and De Silva, so it never bothered me as it did the judge, and I always had the thermostat all the way down. Yet on several occasions, I'd find the room getting uncomfortably hot and notice that the thermostat had been turned up really high. The only way it could have been turned up was by me, and I never touched it. I believe Judge Campbell was at work, trying to keep it warm in his old office. Another purportedly haunted room in the old courthouse is the Shaw Theater, located on the second floor. By all accounts, the formless specter that haunts this room is a sinister masculine entity, which announces its displeasure by slamming doors, blasting visitors with gusts of icy wind, and audibly cursing in the hallway. In their book, Hind and De Silva, citing the chilling experience of a mother and her daughter who once toured the building's second floor, proposed that this spirit might be the restless soul of a prisoner who had been held in the courthouse in the 19th century, before being hanged for a crime of which he was wrongly accused. Just next door to the old courthouse is the elegant Prince of Wales Hotel, one of the most beautiful buildings in the town. Established in 1864 as Long's Hotel, this luxury stopping place received its present name in 1901 when it hosted Edward, Prince of Wales, the son of Queen Victoria, and the future King Edward VII. Legend has it that the lobby of the Prince of Wales Hotel, which was completely refurbished by local craftsmen in 1999, is haunted by the ghost of a young woman who made her fondest memories there sometime between 1914 and 1918, during the Great War. According to this story, the woman fell in love with a soldier who was training at nearby Cap Niagara, a Canadian Army training camp, prior to his deployment to Europe. Not content to wait until the war was over, the young couple decided to tie the knot in a hasty marriage, followed by a brief honeymoon at the Prince of Wales Hotel. Before the newlyweds could settle into their new life together, the soldier and his unit were dispatched to Halifax, where they would board a ship bound for the Old World. For months, the lonely bride penned daily letters to her husband, dreaming of the life they would build when he returned from the trenches. She was utterly devastated when she received the dreaded telegram, informing her that her love had perished in that muddy, rat-infested wasteland. Heartbroken, the young widow fell into a deep despondency, having lost the will to live. Despite her youth, her health rapidly deteriorated, and before long, her delicate body succumbed to the resolution of her soul. It is said that ever since her death, the spirit of the young widow has roamed the halls of the Prince of Wales Hotel, the place where she experienced her last happy memories. There are stories indicating that she expresses her eternal grief by pestering patrons in their rooms, sometimes gently shaking them awake in their beds, or rapping on their doors at night. Some are said to have seen her apparition from the street, gazing mournfully out a second-story window. Others claim to have heard their names called in the hotel lobby at night, when no one else was around. The last haunted spot we will explore in this piece is the Royal George Theatre, located just around the corner from the Old Angel Inn. Built near the end of World War I, this historic building is said to be occupied by two relatively young ghosts. The first of the Royal George's alleged specters is the spirit of Geoffrey Dallas, the theatre's former lighting designer, who was, by all accounts, extremely good at his job. In life, Dallas considered the theatre his home away from home. In death, which came for him in 1989, he apparently found it impossible to part with the old building in which he had honed his craft. According to local legend, every once in a while, the lights of the Royal George flicker, and a fleeting apparition of Jeffrey Dallas appears on stage. The second of the theater's phantoms is supposed to be the ghost of Nancy Kerr, a stage actress and longtime staple of the Royal George, who passed away in 1991. Regarded as a friendly and well-meaning spirit, Kerr is said to occasionally play pranks on performers, nudging actors who forget their lines, and on one occasion, tripping a thespian who richly deserved it. If you happen to find yourself in the Niagara area, and don't shrink at the prospect of a brush with the paranormal, a visit to Niagara-on-the-Lake is definitely worth a detour. At Fort George, you can explore the tunnel beneath the powder magazine, 
where shades from a forgotten war still linger. At the Old Angel Inn, you can enjoy a pint at Captain Swayze's favorite watering hole, where inanimate objects move of their own accord, and gray ladies walk through walls. If you're lucky, you might just have an encounter with one of the eternal residents of Canada's most haunted town. For centuries, North America's five great lakes have served as the setting for a host of legends, folktales, and nautical mysteries. The local Ojibwe First Nations, for example, tell stories of fabulous monsters which inhabit the depths, shores, and skies of these inland seas. From the Mishapishu, a huge horned aquatic creature imbued with mystical powers, to the Thunderbird, the enemy of the Mishapishu, responsible for the creation of lightning storms, to the Memogo Visui, long-haired sirens who reside within the coldest, deepest recesses of these freshwater oceans. French-Canadian voyageurs who paddled their birch bark canoes across these waters during the days of the North American fur trade had their own tales of haunted spots and curious locales, like the pictured rocks on the shores of Lake Superior, a series of colorful sandstone bluffs pitted with dark caverns which were said to be home to a mischievous spirit, and La Cloche, a strange rock on an island in Lake Huron which, when struck, rang like a bell across the water. More modern Michigan lore is replete with stories of bottomless subterranean outlets which connect these massive bodies of water with smaller adjacent lakes and waterways. Legend has it that underwater currents draw the corpses of drowned sailors into these outlets, engendering another popular folktale which contends that the Great Lakes never give up their dead. Of all the strange stories and legends surrounding the Great Lakes, perhaps the most chilling are those pertaining to the host of ships and sailors that the lakes have swallowed over the years. Undoubtedly, the most famous of these is the tale of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, a massive Great Lakes freighter whose mysterious and untimely demise was immortalized in Canadian folk singer Gordon Lightfoot's 1976 hit song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The story of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald begins in 1957, when an American insurance company called Northwestern Mutual commissioned the ship's construction and named it after its president. With a length of 729 feet or 222 meters, and a gross registered tonnage of 13,632, it was at the time of its launch the largest vessel to ever ply the waters of the Great Lakes. The SS Edmund Fitzgerald began its career on an ominous note. During its christening in Detroit, Michigan, Elizabeth Fitzgerald, the wife of the businessman after whom the freighter was named, tried three times to smash a champagne bottle over the ship's bow, succeeding on the last. When the ropes securing the ship to the shore were subsequently severed, the freighter slid down a ramp into the Detroit River and hit the water at an awkward angle, sending up an enormous wave that doused all who attended the ceremony. The shock of the cold water sent one of the onlookers into cardiac arrest. The 58-year-old attendee, who had traveled from Toledo, Ohio to witness the launch, died on the scene. Despite its inauspicious inauguration, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald went on to enjoy a brief but prosperous career hauling taconite, processed pellets of iron ore, across the Great Lakes. Due to its speed and cargo capacity, the freighter routinely set hauling records during the 748 trips it completed throughout its lifetime. On the afternoon of November 9, 1975, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald left Superior, Wisconsin for a steel mill near Detroit, its cargo hold filled with 26,000 tons of taconite. It was captained by Ernest McSorley, a heavy-weather Canadian-born mariner known for his quiet stoicism and his willingness to sail through rough waters, and was crewed by 28 veteran sailors. About three hours into her voyage, she overtook and was subsequently trailed by another taconite-laden cargo ship called the SS Arthur M. Anderson, whose captain, Jesse Bernie Cooper, agreed to accompany the Edmund Fitzgerald across Lake Superior. At that time, a severe winter storm was making its way across the lake. Fueled by the collision of cold Arctic winds with warm fronts from the Gulf of Mexico, these ferocious cyclonic gales are referred to colloquially as the Witch of November. Trusting in the experience of their crews and the integrity of the vessels they commanded, neither McSorley nor Cooper thought twice about steering their freighters into the heart of this rapidly intensifying tempest. 
the prudent captains adopted a course along Lake Superior's northern Canadian shore, which would offer them some protection from the storm, and kept in regular contact with each other via radio. The Edmund Fitzgerald and the Arthur M. Anderson pushed on throughout the night, weathering what Captain McSorley described as the worst sea he had ever been in. The freighters were whipped by 60 mile per hour winds and battered by 10 foot tall waves which gradually wore down the Edmund Fitzgerald. By 3.30 a.m., the freighter had begun to lean to one side. By 5.30, the ship had lost both its radars to the wind and was taking heavy waves over her decks. At 7.10 in the morning, when the Edmund Fitzgerald was about 15 nautical miles from Whitefish Bay and the twin cities of Sault Ste. Marie beyond, Captain Cooper's first mate, Morgan Clark, radioed Captain McSorley to inform him of the presence of a ship which lay ahead of him. He concluded the transmission by asking how the Edmund Fitzgerald was faring. We're holding our own, was McSorley's reply. That was the last anyone ever heard from Ernest McSorley or his crew. Mere moments later, the Edmund Fitzgerald suddenly and mysteriously plummeted 530 feet down to the bottom of Lake Superior, twisting in half in the process, and entombing Captain McSorley and his crew of 28 in a frigid, watery grave. There were no witnesses of the disaster. The crew members of the Arthur M. Anderson only realized that something was amiss when McSorley failed to respond to their radio queries, and when they found that they were unable to see any of the Edmund Fitzgerald's lights in the distance when the fog cleared. When the enormous freighter failed to appear on his radar screen, Captain Cooper called the Canadian Coast Guard and informed them of the situation. An hour later, the American and Canadian Coast Guards launched a joint aerial search for the missing vessel and its crew. The rescue team's efforts were soon supplemented by those of the crews of the Arthur M. Anderson and the William Clay Ford, the latter a freighter anchored nearby, which left the relative safety of Whitefish Bay and joined in the search for the Edmund Fitzgerald. Despite a thorough and concerted search, the only trace of the freighter that the rescue team managed to find that day were the remains of a lifeboat, shattered beyond repair. The following day, as news of the missing freighter began to circulate throughout the Great Lakes region, Father Richard Ingalls of the Mariner's Church of Detroit rang his church's bell 29 times, each toll representing a lost crew member of the Edmund Fitzgerald. For 31 years, the Reverend of the Mariner's Church would continue to perform this ritual on the anniversary of the freighter's disappearance. Three days later, a U.S. Navy aircraft equipped with a metal detection device discovered the wreck of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald lying in two pieces at the bottom of Lake Superior, about 15 nautical miles from the mouth of Whitefish Bay. Subsequent diving operations, one of them conducted by marine explorer Jean-Michel Cousteau, the son of the celebrated French explorer Jacques Cousteau, failed to recover any of the bodies of the 29 sailors who went down with the ship. Throughout the next two decades, many different theories were put forth as to the cause of the freighter's demise. Some believed that the Edmund Fitzgerald had sustained fatal damage while bottoming out on the Six Fathom Shoal northwest of Caribou Island, not far from its final destination. Others maintained that the freighter had been buried by twin rogue waves measuring about 35 feet in height, which the crew of the Arthur M. Anderson had encountered at 6.40 a.m. on the morning of November 10th. Others still suggested that the ship's cargo hold was flooded due to the crew's failure to properly close the hatches that sealed it from the elements. To date, authorities disagree on the specific factors which contributed to the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald, and to this day, the true cause of the freighter's capsizal remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the Great Lakes. In the summer of 1995, Canadian explorer Dr. Joseph B. McInnes led a series of dives on the sunken ship, during which he salvaged the freighter's bell, an artifact which some writers have described as the symbolic heart of the ship. McInnes later replaced the bell with a replica on which was inscribed the names of the 29 sailors who went down with the freighter, a headstone marking the final resting place of the men who lie interred within the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Although the SS Edmund Fitzgerald was the largest ship ever claimed by the Great Lakes, she was neither the first nor the only. Over the past four centuries, over 6,000 ships have come to rest beneath the waves of these five inland seas. Notwithstanding the scores of native birch bark and dugout canoes which must have foundered in these freshwater oceans in centuries past, the first real ship to disappear in the Great Lakes was a French bark called Le Griffon, or the Griffin. 
The Griffin was constructed in the year 1679 by René Robert Cavalier, Sieur de la Salle, an ambitious French adventurer remembered today for his establishment of the vast bygone province known as French Louisiana. Trained in France as a Jesuit priest, La Salle left the Jesuit order in 1667 to pursue fame and fortune in Canada, at that time a French colony called New France. After acquiring some land on the island of Montreal, he had led an unsuccessful expedition in search of the Northwest Passage, the legendary waterway through North America connecting the Atlantic with the Pacific. In 1672, he allied himself with Louis de Boued, Comte de Frontenac, the newly appointed governor of New France. Frontenac hoped to expand the colony westward from its confines in the valley of the St. Lawrence River and bring the fur trade to the Great Lakes. A wild region populated at that time by warring native tribes, a handful of Jesuit missionaries, and independent fur traders called Coureurs des Bois, or Runners of the Woods. In 1673, La Salle helped the governor establish Fort Frontenac at the junction of the St. Lawrence River and Lake Ontario, the colony's first real incursion into the Great Lakes. In 1677, La Salle sailed to France for the purpose of convincing King Louis XIV to grant him permission to establish two more forts on the Great Lakes, one of them at the mouth of the Niagara River, and the other at the southern end of Lake Michigan. He also requested a license to build a sailing ship on Lake Erie, at the end of the Niagara River opposite Lake Ontario. The king granted his request, and La Salle sailed for Canada with 30 shipwrights, carpenters, blacksmiths, and soldiers, as well as an abundance of supplies. La Salle began his enterprise by splitting his party into three groups. One disembarked in canoes and paddled ahead to Lake Michigan to establish a trading relationship with the natives there. Another, headed by a recollect friar named Father Louis Hennepin and a French Royal Army officer named Dominique Lamotte de Lucière, set out in a small sailing vessel for the Niagara River, where they were to choose the location of a new fort. La Salle himself, accompanied by a French maritime pilot and a one-handed Italian soldier named Henry de Tonti, took a small sailing ship to a native village on the shores of Lake Ontario to secure winter provisions for his crew. The enterprise began with a rocky start. Unbeknownst to La Salle, most of the men sent to Lake Michigan squandered their trade goods and deserted. The ship headed by Hennepin and Lamotte became encased in ice near present-day Toronto, and had to be liberated with axes before its occupants could make their way across Lake Ontario to the mouth of the Niagara River. And although La Salle and Tonti managed to obtain provisions at a native village, they lost everything in an accident on Lake Ontario. The party headed by Hennepin and Lamotte managed to reach the mouth of the Niagara River and choose a suitable building site for the fort, which was to be named Fort Conti, after one of La Salle's aristocratic Parisian friends. A few of them decided to head further up the river to the base of what is now Queenston Heights, excepting perhaps a few earlier Jesuit missionaries who failed to write about their experience, Hennepin and his companions thus became the first white men to see the Niagara Falls. That accomplished, Hennepin, Lamotte, and company struck out westward through the forest to the newly established Seneca Iroquois village, where they hoped to have their enterprise sanctioned by the local chief. Back in the 1640s and 50s, the warlike Iroquois Confederacy had left their haunts in the forest of upstate New York to launch a massive offensive against the Huron, Erie, Neutral, and Patoon nations of the Great Lakes. Armed with muskets and steel tomahawks supplied by their Dutch and English allies to the southeast, they wiped out entire nations and drove others from their traditional hunting grounds. In the 1660s, the colonists of New France found themselves drawn into the conflict, obliged to defend their Algonquin allies from the Iroquois invaders. After a series of bloody skirmishes and counter-offensives, New France made a tentative peace with the Iroquois Confederacy in 1666, allowing the invaders to settle the lands of the First Nations they had conquered. Ever since, a shaky tranquility had reigned over the eastern Great Lakes. Eager to maintain the status quo, Hennepin and Lamotte were dismayed when the Seneca chief failed to give his blessing to their enterprise. Fortunately, La Salle had better luck than his subordinates. Upon arriving from his misadventure on Lake Ontario, the explorer personally paid a visit to the chief and convinced him that the Iroquois would benefit from their undertaking. Finally, with the chief's tentative approval, the Frenchman commenced the construction of Fort Conti. In addition to the fort, they also began building a 45-ton bark, or sailing ship, above the Niagara Falls. The construction of this vessel was an unpleasant task for La Salle's men, who began the project by hauling deck spikes, rigging, and other equipment up the portage trail to the riverbank above Niagara Falls. 
Throughout the winter, spring, and early summer, they labored with frozen fingers and empty stomachs, all the while wary of the sullen Iroquois braves who often loitered around the worksite, fingering their tomahawks and war clubs. While his men worked on the ship and the fort, La Salle himself, accompanied by two of his employees, traveled by snowshoe through the forest and across Lake Ontario to Fort Frontenac, where he hoped to replenish the provisions he had lost in the lake. During La Salle's absence, the men on the Niagara River completed both the fort and the 45-ton ship. The latter was christened Les Griffons, or the Griffin, that mythical monster being the primary ornament on Count Frontenac's coat of arms. Its prow bore a wooden carving of the legendary half-lion, half-eagle for which it was named, and its decks bristled with seven small cannons which were fired at its christening. La Salle finally returned to the Niagara River in early August, this time accompanied by three Flemish friars. Eager to make use of the new ship, he and all his men embarked on the Griffin and set out on her maiden voyage across Lake Erie. For three days, the explorers sailed down the length of the lake. On the fourth day, they turned north and sailed up the Detroit River. They crossed Lake St. Clair beyond and proceeded up the St. Clair River into Lake Huron. There, the explorers were beset by a ferocious gale which threatened to capsize their vessel. Praying to St. Anthony of Padua, the patron saint of mariners, the sailors managed to make their way up Lake Huron to the island of Michilimackinac, home to Indian villages and a Jesuit mission, and a haven for Coureur des Bois. La Salle and his crew received a cool welcome from the Jesuits, in whose chapel they celebrated Mass. The explorers were also greeted by the local Huron and Ottawa Indians, who were amazed at the size of their ship. During their visit, they received the disheartening news that most of the 15 men whom La Salle had previously sent to establish a trading relationship with the Indians of Lake Michigan had squandered his trading goods and abandoned their mission. In early September, La Salle and the crew of the Griffin sailed west from Michilimackinac into Lake Michigan and further southwest into Green Bay. There, on an island, he found the few members of his advance party who had remained loyal to him, discovering to his pleasure that they had acquired a small fortune in furs from their trade with the natives. La Salle then had these furs loaded into the cargo hold of the Griffin and ordered a handful of his men to transport them to Fort Conti, asking the ship's pilot to return to Lake Michigan as soon as the cargo was unloaded. The Griffin departed on September 18, 1679, just as a storm began to brew. Aside from the vessel's own crew, La Salle and his explorers were perhaps the last men to set eyes on the Griffin. The vessel disappeared on her homeward voyage, somewhere in the waters of Lakes Michigan, Huron, or Erie. Most assumed that the ship had foundered in a storm, and was lost with all hands. This theory is supported by the discoveries of Albert Cullis, who manned the Mississauga Strait Lighthouse on Manitoulin Island in the 19th century. In the late 1890s, Cullis reputedly discovered a watch chain, three 17th century coins, and five human skeletons in and around a cave on Manitoulin Island. Another theory regarding the fate of the Griffin contends that the ship was boarded by hostile Indians who murdered her crew before setting her ablaze. La Salle and his crew certainly had their fair share of rivals who would stop at nothing to protect their own interests in the fur trade. La Salle himself suspected that the ship's occupants had intentionally scuttled the Griffin and made off with the furs she contained. In letters to Count Frontenac, the explorer wrote about an Indian rumor which held that, in 1680, white men matching the description of the crew of the Griffin had been captured by Indians on the Mississippi River, paddling canoes filled with valuable goods. The natives killed every crew member but the captain, whom they took prisoner. La Salle believed that these unfortunates constituted the ship's crew, who had intentionally sank his vessel and made off with his furs with the intention of joining a famous coureur de bois named Daniel Grézonon, Sieur de Loup. Whatever the case, the Griffin's undiscovered wreck is considered today to be the holy grail of Great Lakes shipwreck hunters. Over 130 years after the Griffin's disappearance, half a century after France ceded Canada to Great Britain, and nearly four decades after Britain ceded her 13 colonies to the United States, the Great Lakes resounded with the thunder of cannons and the rattle of musketry in a conflict known today as the War of 1812. Angered by the British Royal Navy's practice of impressing American citizens into service, and insulted by King George III's attempts to prevent American merchants from trading with Napoleonic France, with whom Britain was at war, the United States Congress declared war on Great Britain, initiating the War of 1812. 
Throughout the summer and autumn of that year, the Great Lakes bore witness to a number of deadly clashes between American and British Canadian forces, including the successful British Siege of Detroit and a failed American invasion of Upper Canada, the Canadian side of the Great Lakes. On April 27, 1813, the U.S. Army and Navy launched an attack on the British city of York, present-day Toronto, situated on the western shores of Lake Ontario. The American soldiers successfully captured the city, only to be killed and maimed by the detonation of the fort's powder magazine, the tremendous explosion having been orchestrated by the retreating British. The Americans avenged this act by plundering the town and setting many of its buildings on fire. The U.S. troops went on to attack and capture the southeasterly Fort George, situated at the mouth of the Niagara River, opposite the river from the site of La Salle's Fort Conti. Later that summer, they attempted to besiege a British garrison at present-day Burlington, Ontario, southwest of York. The British Royal Navy sailed out to stop them, and thus, on the morning of August 7, 1813, the British and American Great Lakes fleets found themselves face to face, just beyond cannon range of one another, unable to engage due to an uncharacteristic absence of wind which settled over Lake Ontario. One of the vessels in the U.S. fleet during this spell was a Canadian merchant schooner turned American warship called the USS Scourge, and one of the sailors aboard that vessel was a Canadian expat named Ned Myers. Many years later, Myers would tell his story to celebrated American novelist James Fenimore Cooper, who put his tale into print in his 1843 biography of him entitled Life Before the Mast. Myers, via Cooper's book, wrote, It was a lovely evening, not a cloud visible, and the lake being as smooth as a looking glass. The English fleet was but a short distance to the northward of us, so near, indeed, that we could almost count their ports. They were becalmed like ourselves, and a little shattered. After having their supper, Myers and the crew of the USS Scourge bedded down next to their cannons. Myers wrote, I was soon asleep as if lying in the bed of a king. How long my nap lasted or what took place in the interval I cannot say. I awoke, however, in consequence of large drops of rain falling on my face. When I opened my eyes, it was so dark I could not see the length of the deck. As Myers snuck away from his post to retrieve a bottle of grog, the schooner on which he served was suddenly beset by a violent storm. The scourge quickly took on water and, in less than a minute, began to sink. The flashes of lightning were incessant and nearly blinded me, Myers wrote. Our decks seemed on fire, and yet I could see nothing. I heard no hail, no order, no call. But the schooner was filled with the shrieks and cries of the men to leeward, who were lying jammed under the guns, shot boxes, shot, and other heavy things that had gone down as the vessel fell over. I now crawled aft on the upper side of the bulwarks, amid a most awful and infernal din of thunder and shrieks and dazzling flashes of lightning, the wind blowing all the while like a tornado. It now came across me that if the schooner should write, she was filled and must go down, and that she might carry me with her in the suction. I made a spring, therefore, and fell into the water several feet from the place where I had stood. It is my opinion the schooner sank as I left her. Myers began to swim for the first time in his life. By chance, he bumped into a lifeboat into which he managed to climb. Through an oppressive darkness punctuated by blinding flashes of lightning, he searched for survivors and managed to drag seven fellow soldiers into the tiny craft. Myers and his shipmates were later rescued by American sailors, whose ship had survived the tempest. In addition to the scourge, the storm claimed another U.S. Navy schooner, called the USS Hamilton. Of the 102 sailors aboard these vessels at the time of the squall, only 16 survived their capsizing, many of them having been trapped inside the ships during their 300-foot descent to the bottom of the lake. Legend has it that on foggy nights in the waters outside Burlington, Ontario, sailors sometimes spy two old-fashioned square-sailed vessels, with their gun ports open and their decks illuminated by the eerie glow of lanterns hanging in the rigging. As soon as they are spotted, these phantasmal vessels shake as if buffeted by unearthly winds before sinking below the surface, all the while accompanied by the faint shrieks of drowning sailors whose skeletons lie below, entombed within the wrecks of the USS Scourge and the USS Hamilton. Another of the thousands of ships devoured by the Great Lakes over the past four centuries is the SS Kamloops, a steam-powered freighter which sank with all hands off Isle Royal in Lake Superior just south of Thunder Bay, Ontario, in 1927. 
What distinguishes the SS Kamloops from other Great Lakes wrecks are the crew members, both corporeal and ethereal, who are said to still wander its decks at the bottom of the lake. The SS Kamloops began her life in 1924, in a shipyard in northeast England. Commissioned by the Montreal-based shipping company Canada Steamship Lines, she had a length of 250 feet and a gross tonnage of 2,402, making her one of the smaller freighters on the Great Lakes at the time. Her limited size allowed her to traverse the Welland Canal, an artificial waterway connecting Lake Ontario with Lake Erie. After steaming across the Atlantic Ocean and up the St. Lawrence River to her home on the Great Lakes, the SS Kamloops was put to work hauling manufactured goods, many of them destined for the rapidly developing prairie provinces, from the St. Lawrence to Lake Superior. Due to the hazardous Great Lakes freighting practice of shipping as late as possible prior to winter freeze-up, the steamer and her crew had a few close calls. In 1926, for example, the freighter became trapped in ice in the St. Mary's River, the waterway which connects Lake Huron with Lake Erie. In late November 1927, the SS Kamloops, under the command of Captain William Bryan, was tasked with hauling a mixed cargo from Montreal to Fort William, Ontario, a district of what is now Thunder Bay. On this journey, it trailed in the wake of the SS Quaidoc, an empty grain carrier also bound for Fort William. The Kamloops passed through the Sioux Locks, a water lift on the St. Mary's River, on December 4th, when it was beset by a howling northern gale. On the night of December 6th, in the waters off Isle Royal, the captain of the SS Quaidoc spied a dark, misshapen mass looming before him through the fog. He and his crew frantically maneuvered their vessel to avoid the mysterious obstacle, and narrowly avoided what promised to be a catastrophic collision. They sounded their foghorn to warn Captain Bryan and the crew of the Kamloops, and continued on to Fort William. Disturbingly, the SS Kamloops failed to make it into port that night. In the days that followed the storm, search and rescue crews scoured the surrounding area for a number of different ships that had failed to arrive at their destinations. Most of these were found stranded in different areas of the lake, having been blown off course during the gale. Only the SS Kamloops remained unaccounted for. Canadian winter hit the Great Lakes shortly after the freighter's disappearance, and the waters of Superior began to freeze. It soon became apparent to even the most hopeful friends and family members that there was virtually no chance that any of the SS Kamloops crew of 22 had survived the mysterious calamity that befell their ship. In the spring of 1928, fishermen plying their trade off the coast of Isle Royal discovered two half-frozen corpses washed up on the island's shore. The bodies were identified as crew members of the SS Kamloops. Several months later, in early June, fishermen found six more bodies on the island, five of them huddled together as if for warmth. One of the corpses was identified as 22-year-old Alice Betridge, one of the two women serving aboard the SS Kamloops on the night of its disappearance. Half a year later, a trapper discovered a handwritten note in a pickle jar near the mouth of the Agoa River, across Lake Superior from Isle Royal, which Alice had apparently scrawled in her final moments. The message reads, I am the last one left alive, freezing and starving to death on Isle Royal. I just want Mom and Dad to know my fate. The letter was signed, Al, who is dead. On August 21st, 1977, Minneapolis-based recreational diver Ken Engelbrecht discovered the wreck of the SS Kamloops while searching for the vessel off the northern shore of Isle Royal. The steamboat lay on her starboard side, 270 feet below the water's surface. Inside the ship's engine room floated two human corpses with snow-white skin, both of them in excellent condition due to the preservative effects of the ice-cold water in which they were immersed, and the relative absence of aquatic life at that depth. One of these bodies evidently belonged to Nettie Grafton, the ship's stewardess and Alice Betridge's only female companion during the SS Kamloops final voyage. The other was an unidentified man wearing a wedding ring, whom future divers nicknamed Grandpa and Old Whitey. A number of divers who have explored the wreck of the SS Kamloops following her discovery in 1977 have reported an eerie phenomenon endemic to that underwater graveyard. The body of old Whitey, they say, moved about the ship throughout the course of their aqueous escapades, as if on its own accord. 
some divers swear that they were approached by the chalk-white corpse while examining the perfectly preserved candy wrappers that lay about the wreckage. Others claim to have witnessed the colorless cadaver float towards their hapless diving partners while the latter's attention were diverted. Many of those who have written on the subject have dismissed Old Whitey's alarming antics as a result of underwater currents unconsciously produced by the divers themselves. Others have ascribed the corpse's uncanny animation to the spirit of the sailor who once inhabited it, doomed to wander the decks of the ship whose violent and untimely demise coincided with his own. Whatever the case, the nature of Old Whitey's activity remains one of the many secrets held by the SS Kamloops, which sank quickly and mysteriously nearly a century ago. No compilation of the nautical mysteries of Canada's Great Lakes would be complete without a nod to the SS Bannockburn, a steamship which disappeared somewhere in Lake Superior on a snowy November day in 1902. To this day, the wreck of the SS Bannockburn remains undiscovered, despite, some say, the efforts of her ghostly crew, who are said to appear to sailors from time to time on the decks of their phantom vessel, perhaps in the vicinity of their final resting place, before vanishing into thin air. The SS Bannockburn was constructed in 1893 by the British shipbuilding magnate Sir Railton Dixon. The 245-foot-long steamer was designed to fit through the Welland Canal and equipped with a steel hull for added protection. She was launched that same year and sent across the Atlantic and up the St. Lawrence River to her new home on the Great Lakes. Throughout the course of her life, the SS Bannockburn was plagued by misfortune. In April 1897, she ran into a cluster of sea rocks near the Snake Island Lighthouse on Lake Ontario, southwest of Kingston. She began to take on water, forcing her crew to dump much of her cargo into the lake in order to keep her afloat. The ship was subsequently patched up and put back into service, only to suffer another mishap several months later. In October 1897, while hauling a load of grain from Chicago to Kingston, the SS Bannockburn hit a wall of the Welland Canal and foundered in that shallow waterway. The SS Bannockburn began what would be her final earthly voyage on November 20th, 1902, leaving Fort William with 85,000 bushels of wheat in her hold. While leaving port, she grounded in shallow water. Although the accident did not appear to damage the ship in any way, it was decided that the voyage would be postponed until the following day. On November 21st, the SS Bannockburn set out once again for Georgian Bay, at the eastern end of Lake Huron skirting the northern shores of Lake Superior. Her 21-man crew sailed her without incident to a point about 40 miles northeast of Isle Royal, where she was spotted by the captain of another Great Lakes freighter named James McMaw. Using his binoculars, the captain checked on the ship periodically as he passed her. After attending to some business on his own vessel, McMaw raised his binoculars once again and discovered, to his surprise, that the Bannockburn was nowhere to be seen. Before he could relocate the ship, a heavy fog rolled in and obscured his vision. Captain McMaw supposed that the mist must have shrouded the Bannockburn and continued on his way. That night, the Witch of November reared her ugly head and swept across Lake Superior, whipping up waves and buffeting boats. At about 11 o'clock p.m., through a haze of wind-blown snow, the crew of a passenger steamer called the SS Huronic spied a pattern of ship lights which they recognized as the Bannockburns. The freighter did not appear to be in distress, and the two vessels passed each other without incident. The crew of the SS Huronic were perhaps the last men to set eyes on the SS Bannockburn, at least in physical form. When the freighter missed her appointment at Sioux Locks, few were overly concerned, assuming that her crew had taken shelter somewhere to wait out the storm. When the Bannockburn failed to show up the following day, it became clear that some mishap had befallen her. When a week and a half had elapsed, the ship was presumed lost with all hands. As the Kingston-based newspaper, the British Whig, put it in their December 2, 1902 issue, it is generally conceded that the missing steamer is not within earthly hailing distance, that she has found an everlasting berth in the unexplored depths of Lake Superior, and that the facts of her foundering will never be known. It is asserted by mariners that the Bannocksburn's boilers must have exploded causing her to sink immediately without giving those aboard a moment in which to seek escape. If this theory is correct, 
then the big steamer quickly sank beneath the waves of that great lake, carrying down her crew to a quick and sure death. It is sad to know that so many lives were lost, but the sorrow strikes home the deeper when it is known that the greater part of the crew were well known in this city. The only trace of the steamer to ever surface was a blood-stained life preserver made from cork, which washed up on the shores of Grand Marais, Michigan, at the western end of Lake Superior, on December 15, 1902. Throughout the winter, divers searched in vain for the wreck of the SS Bannockburn. To date, the ship's whereabouts remain unknown. Legend has it that, every so often, sailors will spot the ghost of the Bannockburn plowing her way through the waves of Lake Superior, her lamps flickering and her pilot house dark, before vanishing into the spray. This legend has become so well known throughout Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Northern Ontario that the ghost of the Bannockburn has acquired the nickname the Flying Dutchman of the Great Lakes. The Dutchman being a legendary ghost ship doomed to perpetually sail the turbulent waters off South Africa's Cape of Good Hope. Some say that the crew of the Bannockburn willingly endures a similar fate, routinely returning from the great beyond to sail the frigid waters of Lake Superior in the hope that their final resting place will one day be discovered and accorded the respect it deserves. <laughs>